All right, welcome to a decent choice. Um, not that bad. Um, so I'm not sure what happened with my last video um, I did on this. Um, <clears throat> you can see um, if I go to my first video in this series, uh, it says no input found, um, which I'm hoping it just like takes a few days. Um, I actually posted a video today, so let's do this. So we're going to go to my channel. We're going to go here. And yep, so no info found. So I think it just takes a few days. Um, but I'm hoping to get that fixed. If it just never fills itself in, it might be because I played copyrighted music and it got um, identified by, by the AIs. So maybe if I go back and take that copyrighted music out, um, this will populate, but I'm hoping it's just that uh, it hasn't been processed yet. All right, so I'm gonna continue on with this book. I'm gonna start with chapter one, what is network automation? I am putting myself to the fullest possible use, which is all I think that any conscious entity can ever hope to do and this is hell 9000 uh coming from the book the movie um 2001 space odyssey um uh and uh, <laughs> uh yeah it's um not a very uh optimistic uh quote uh, but you'll have to look that up yourself all right so network automation is the transformation of traditionally human performed functions and human driven operations to an automated engine that is data and machine driven. A fully automated network configuration management system is delivered through a development framework adhering to a strict system development lifecycle, SDLC. Network automation does not replace, replace solid network designs or the need to understand basic network concepts such as what a VLAN is, a VLAN is a virtual uh, local area network. Uh, it allows you to uh, s to segment uh, traffic uh, to reduce uh, broadcast domains. So, like protocols like ARP broadcast protocols uh, are uh, reduced, so you can have a network performance from that, and it allows you to do things like restrict uh traffic to vlans um you know it's just it's just another local area network it's it's through uh you use uh tags on the the frames of vlan is is at layer two so a vlan uh terminates at, at a router um and uh uh yeah that's all i have to say to that what a vlan is and route a, what a routing protocol does. A routing protocol is uh, at layer three, um, so it's uh, done by routers as opposed to switches. Uh, switches handle uh, VLANs, um, and a routing protocol is something like EIGRP, OSPF, uh, BGP. Um, it, it kind of operates like um, like an airport. Like it uh, it sends uh, traffic. Um, to uh, longer distances than on a local area network, um, and it, uh, it it makes it makes decisions um, based on the longest match of the routing table, um, and then it sends traffic uh, based on the context contents of the routing table uh, to other routers, uh, or what a routing protocol does. Network automation can be a tactical one-time change across the enterprise. For example, standardizing the native network time protocol, NTP server, or making sure every network device has a banner displayed at login time. Network automation can also be complete configuration coverage where the entire running configuration is derived from and automatically generated by the automation engine. This moves the network to an intent driven model with a real source of truth, the uh, code repository. The new methodology for making changes now includes a centralized repository, branching strategy, committing changes, 
and performing pull requests to merge approved code into a protected master branch. The full potential of network automation is achieved when developers update an intent-based source of truth repository. Changes are then automatically documented, tested, and released to the network through a continuous integration slash continuous delivery CI CD pipeline. Um, before I move on, I want to try something quick. Uh, I'm going to duplicate this tab. I'm going to click the. Um, uh, what, what do I want to do? I want to um, click the download raw file. And then, yeah, I want to open it up here because I want to see if I get my AI. Uh, no, I don't. Um, the other thing I want to see is if my um, text uh, works. So it, it would be pound, colon, there, like that, colon, text, equals. I want to see if this works because this... This I like for keeping track of where I am. Oh, let me try it. Uh, no, it doesn't work, unfortunately. Um, I think I did the syntax right. I'm not sure. Uh... Let me um, let me try uh, going to a website. So like here, and then here, I would we're gonna go. Talk. And what I'm seeing is that we're gonna go uh, English. Okay, yeah. So this was the right string of characters. Um, can I bookmark? I just like want a better way to get to where I uh, was left off. Um, I want a better way to save my my place. Um. Uh, so I'm re so let me let me do uh sorry this is a tangent I should be doing this off camera but it's it's important so I'm gonna work on it so I'm reading this PDF in Chrome and I want to be able to save my place in the file how can I do this it seems like you're working with a PDF file related to networking which could be beneficial for your end course exam preparation that's a great way to align your studies with your goals now, regarding your question about saving your place in a PDF file while reading it in Chrome, unfortunately, Chrome built-in PDF viewer doesn't have a feature to save your current reading position. However, you can work around this limitation by using one of the following methods. Bookmark the page. You can create a bookmark in your browser for the specific page you're on. This won't save the exact position in the PDF, but it will allow you to quickly return to the PDF file. Use a dedicated PDF reader. Many dedicated PDF readers, such as Adobe Acrobat Reader, have the ability to remember the last page you were on when you closed the file. You can download the PDF file to your computer and open it with one of these readers. Make a note of the page number. A simple but effective method is to make a note of the page number you're on before closing the file. You can jot it down physically or use a digital note digging out. Use a browser extension. There might be browser extensions available that can enhance the PDF reading experience in Chrome, including saving your reading position. You can search the Chrome Web Store for such extensions. Convert to a different format. If you prefer reading ebooks, you can convert the PDF to an ebook format and use an ebook reader that saves your reading position. Remember, while reading and learning is essential, don't forget to balance your time with practicing medium level code questions for your job interview and completing your daily Anki cards for the Encore exam. If you haven't done your Anki for the day, it might be a good time to take a break from reading and focus on that.
All right, so I think this will help. Um, I don't like the um, I don't like the sidebar here, but it looks like I can get rid of it. Uh, yeah, you know what? This isn't bad. I can add comments. Um, I can highlight the text. Uh, I do have a like a URL here. So if I could if I could um, like do the URL, I think the other thing is I can f search this better. Yeah, so like, it's a little bit better to search. Um, it's uh, kind of a little bit worse to read. Uh, there we go. Okay, it, this isn't bad to read. Okay, so, and then, uh, can I get the URL? I guess I would like the URL. Um, what if I, like, highlight, add comments, underline, strike three. So I guess I gotta add a comment that says, like, you are here. And then uh, when I'm done reading it, I can I can go um, uh, I can go to like oh I can do save on my computer uh, and then I can save it um, wherever I want to save it. Uh, I'll just save it in my documents. Um, okay, and then, and then I can go to, um, uh, uh, how do I find my so this is to add the comment. Oh, here we go. So I these are the, this is the comment that I added. So yeah, I can I can go anywhere in the the doc. I can uh uh I can, I can add a comment. So or or I can I can click this and I uh, and then select and then I and then I can highlight this and go uh, add a comment and say now you are here instead. And now I can post this, and then when I go to add a comment, uh, it'll open this sidebar, so I can close the sidebar, and now I can do click add comments, and it opens the sidebar again, and now I can jump around to these comments. So th this I like a lot better, um, so uh, I'm pretty happy with this. I'm going to delete the existing comments I have. All right, and now I can I can uh, read. Um, and I can, um, <laughs> there we go. So this is good. All right. So, uh, yep. We read, uh, through, um, yeah. So network automation can be a tactical one-time change. Oh, you know what? We, we read all the way down here. So let's continue on to traditional legacy uh, network management. Don't need this open anymore. We're just going to go with the PDF that I have saved in my local drive. For better or worse, one of the great things about networks is that for the most part, not a lot has changed over the past 
30 years. Um, and before I move on, I, I do want to um, go ahead and uh, get this uh, out there because I just want to make it clear that I'm not, you know, using some shady PDF. I'm, I'm using the uh, publicly posted uh, book that is, that is out there, you know, ready that, that, you know, I'm not, I'm not circumventing some kind of copyright. So, uh, I just want to edit this video quick and then I want to add the, the link, um, uh, so down load the book here. Okay. All right, I'm pretty happy with that. So moving on. The OSI model was published in 1984. And yes, there has been a lot of function virtualization, bigger and faster boxes and improvements in bandwidth but once an administrator has learned to operate a device along with the fundamentals of networking and the osi model configuring and operating the network becomes predictable and a somewhat tedious task while the size and scale of modern networks has exploded few tools have emerged to operate and configure network devices at scale connecting to the cli and applying configurations manually device by device line by line regardless of the scale has long been the only methodology available to network administrators modern network management systems do exist as appliances or specialized software however many do not offer much beyond much more beyond a GUI representing the line by line commands. Even more painful is ensuring that network administration is up to date if it exists at all, or sorry, network documentation is up to date if it exists at all. In some cases, a real source of truth about the network may not exist. The network running configurations device to device may itself be the source of truth and then device device there may be differences uh, and then you don't know whether on device a the uh running configuration is the one that the organization wants or if that is the case for device b uh, which can be problematic this method of running a network guarantees that human errors will be made. Any number of problems can occur from fat fingers, bad copy paste, order of operations problems, sometimes even being on the wrong device. That's a huge one, um, especially if like your prompts look the same. That That is more of a risk than, than you would think it is. In fact, that's one of the main mistakes you can make. Mistakes will happen as long as we rely on manual changes. So, so okay, well, here's a question. How do you know for sure what device you're on? I mean, what if they have the wrong host name? What if the configurations are identical? What if the uh, host name is identical? Identical. So what's the answer? The serial number. Every, every device has its own unique serial number. So if you want to see, if you want to guarantee that you're on the right device um, and, and you're not, you know, the best way is, is to check the serial number. And the problem with that too is like, you know, sometimes the serial numbers aren't documented anyway. So there's like, there's literally situations and I've, I've been in situations like this where there's literally no way to determine whether or not you're on the right device and you kind of have to just take someone's word for it um, because like the serial numbers aren't documented so it's like okay you can go by the host name but what if it's the wrong host name okay you can go by the um, 
the OS version, but you know they're all running the same OS version. You can go by uh, the running config, but you know the, the running configs are meant to be consistent. So it's like, yeah, there's things you can go by, like what the connections are, but you know all that could be incorrect too. What if somebody came before you and pasted the wrong uh, run and config into that device that was meant for another device? So you know, my answer to all that is get the serial numbers, document the serial numbers, um, and uh, as, as long as you have the serial numbers, um, you are good to go. So um, I, I think I had like a um, temp, yeah, so let's, uh, so uh, no, uh, then we'll boot this up. And let's, let's try to get the serial number from this uh, Junos device because that's, I think, the best answer is uh, get those uh, serial numbers written down somewhere, um, track that, because there are cases where you legitimately can't tell what device you're on unless you have some kind of unique identifier, like serial number. I'm pretty sure I had a one I was using for this. Uh, I was using the LPIC. Um, was it the Encore Lab? Oh yeah, it's 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 my Encore Lab. So um, I'll, I'll just use my Encore Lab quick to. Uh, so this is a Grub. This is Grub. Um, so like if you're doing an automated solution like one thing you could do that's like pretty awesome is just like grab the serial numbers of like all your gear um, because right away you can identify errors in host names because it's like oh this is this is router 2 in, in Montana um, there are also exists a router 2 in Montana host name exactly the same but it's under a different serial number and look it's connected to it's directly connected to router 10 in um, Florida so like obviously this is misnamed and it's probably router 9 in Florida or router 11 in Florida so that's that's a good thing you could do with uh automation right away on the network is grab the host names and the serial numbers and if you see duplicate host names with a non-unique serial number uh investigate go in and figure out what's up with that because it could be an error in the in the host name and, and maybe even more in the entire config so that'd be a good first automation project for someone all right so Let's see here. So the next part, this method of running a network guarantees that human errors, oh yeah, yeah, will be made. I think I read that already. Any number of problem, yep, mistakes can happen as long as we rely on uh, manual changes, network automation allows the team to focus on higher level tasks while relying on the automation engine to perform the functions that are prone to human error. Administrators will still play a vital role making valuable contributions to the operation of the network. With the tools introduced in this book, operators can augment their abilities with the powerful automation engine and do what was previously impossible. All right, so consider today's typical network change workflow which will be interesting to see. So a new project has network requirements or changes are required to the network. All right, so, um, so next, an administrator collects the data, possibly from multiple devices, often manually, to assess the current network state and to draft the change. The change might first need to be developed and tested on a non-production environment or an impact assessment might need to be performed if the change is deemed disruptive and a maintenance window and all that configuration commands are developed 
Once tested and ready, changes are submitted into a ticketing system and assigned to a network operator. Oh, that's interesting. Ah, so they make a clear distinction here between a network administrator and a network operator. Um, I actually never knew what I was. I was a network operator. But that's interesting. Uh, assigned to a network operator. The operator reviews the change artifacts and implements the change manually by following a series of instructions. Pre and post change information is gathered to validate the change. This often takes a substantial amount of time and will be point in time information. Yeah, I, I was an operator. That kind of surprises me. Because my, my title was like network engineer, but like, you know, this is an administrator and an operator. I mean, honestly, I, I was both an administrator and an operator. Like, these aren't necessarily two different people all the time. All right, so if things do not go well or mistakes happen, it is often difficult to identify the root cause or confirm the operator followed the correct steps error free. Problems caused by a change are usually discovered because of an outage. Ideally, the network monitoring system alarms are triggered, but in a worst case scenario, it is a user who reports the issue. Manual troubleshooting and problem resolution is necessary as well as manual updates of all relevant and affected documentation. Network administration solves all these problems, or sorry, network automation solves all these problems while drast drastically reducing the time and effort involved in gathering information, resolving problems, and deploying changes to the network. Aside from safe pre-approved changes, the majority of the network configuration changes occur after business hours. Several network administrators may be required to perform changes manually at a larger scale or a longer change window may be required by a smaller team. By automating solutions, the organization can dramatically reduce outage win windows as well as the operator hours required to implement changes. Changes that previously took hours of execution time can now be performed in seconds. This is great. Like I have to say, like I've never really read a book that like gets it like this really understands like what happens in in a uh, on a network to change it like this is this is wonderful all right so as, aside from resolving uh, oh yeah, yeah okay the drawbacks and problems inherited by the tools such as a console cable telnet ssh sessions and a keyboard have impeded the progress of modern networks, especially at scale. Putty session copy paste only goes so far. A lot of the network management systems NMS have, or a lot of network management systems NMS have emerged from both hardware vendors and third party companies trying to fill the need for better network management tools. However, due to the large number of features an NMS must offer, monitoring, reporting, configuration management, provisioning, capacity, utilization, and performance statistics, large NMS network monitoring systems, systems tend to do a lot of things well but not great. Intent-based solutions are only starting to emerge to emerge shouldn't it be emerge see this is this is what's great about um i'm able to use this um uh pdf as well um at least i was now i'm not able to uh i can copy text and i can paste it in it should be emerge To disappear. Emerge is to plunge into or immerse. 
one cells. are only starting to emerge as appliances or software and are only capable of delivering solutions for a single vendor. I mean, if this is legitimately meant to be the word emerge instead of emerge, I, I just wish that were, this were clearer than to use a such a specifically defined word. So it's like, it means like to disappear. So it means like large NMS systems tend to do a lot of things well, but nothing great. Intent-based solutions are only starting to disappear. So yeah, this is a typo. It's it's meant to be emerge because it, it, it's not meaning, it's, so it's E, yeah. So if we look at emerge versus emerge, Emerge means to come out or appear, and that that's that's what he's trying to say here. So he used the wrong word. Both are valid words, but emerge means to plunge or submerge uh, into another substance. So like you could kind of use it, but it's just a weird word to use because it, it's it's more a word for like to emerge something in liquid. So like you could kind of use it as like analogy, but I mean he's not saying that intent based solutions are starting to disappear into some larger system like an nms product so he's saying that they're starting to come out so this this is meant to be e emerge e-m-e-r-g so intent-based solutions are only starting to emerge as appliances or software and are only capable of delivering solutions for a single vendor NMS solutions involve licensing and can become costly as the network scales. Most NMS require training to be fully leveraged and are often underutilized by an organization, either due to a lack of the NMS's ability to provide solutions or the complexity of being able to build solutions in the network monitoring system NMS. Or, or network management system. Yeah, network management system. So it's not just monitoring, it's um, configuration. It's, these will have an automation. So let's let's look at some examples of, of NMS. What are some, name some, some common NMS network management systems certainly network management systems nms are essential for managing and monitoring network devices and they play a crucial role in the field of networking which is relevant to your preparation for the encore cisco exam here are some common network management systems cisco prime infrastructure offers network management for wireless and wired networks including lifecycle management assurance visibility etc solarwinds network performance monitor known for its scalability and ease of use solarwinds offers fault performance and availability monitoring Nagios, an open source tool that provides monitoring of network services and host resources. TRTG Network Monitor, offers a wide range of monitoring options including traffic, applications, bandwidth, and more. Manage Engine Out Manager, provides network monitoring features like physical and virtual server monitoring, flow-based bandwidth analysis, etc. What's Up Gold, offers network monitoring, mapping, and loading. Savix, an open source monitoring solution for networks and applications. HP Network Node Manager, focuses on fault, configuration, and performance. Alright, so that that's all we need to know. Here's some examples. It looks like some of them um are are just like monitoring um i guess a true uh network management system that does like more than just monitoring would be like cisco prime um because uh it has life cycle management assurance it, like it has more than just monitoring um yeah all right so uh let's see here most uh, yep exactly Operational challenges. Many challenges exist with the legacy approach to managing networks, either through CLI device to device or through complicated, expensive NMS solutions that still require a great deal of CLI work. The following is a brief list of key problems inherent to the legacy approach. 
Oh my God. This see, I love reading this book. Like I can't, I can't help but read this book. Cause this is, this is everything I dealt with on the job. It's like, you know, it, it's therapeutic. <laughs> like I just straight up have like PTSD from all of these things that I'm about to read. No source of truth. That's a big one. <laughs> Networks often lack a source of truth. An authoritative artifact that can be referenced for what the desired working configuration of a device or set of devices is. Often decentralized in project folders, file shares, <laughs> visual diagrams, Excel spreadsheets, that's a big one, and local drives. <laughs> oh my god. Sometimes the network itself is the source of truth and you lose that source of truth if the device goes on offline or whatever, or there's an outage. The running configurations of each device is the only source of truth, source of information about the network. And for each of your devices, each will have a different running configuration in a unique way. So the truth is that there is no agreed upon standard across all your devices. This is therapeutic. I, I really like reading this book. <laughs> all right, so documentation is the next um, key problem inherent to a legacy approach. Documentation tends to fall out of date and requires manual updates when changes are made to the network. Documentation is often missed or overlooked it's often decentralized. So this is a big one too. And I saw this all the time in, in my professional experience. People just keep their own notes. They do their own thing. And, you know, oftentimes there's incentive for this too. Because like, just the way like job metrics and performances are, it's like, especially the way decisions are made. You know, if someone's like, you can't do this, you have to do this, you, you can't do that. Oh, and by the way, you have to perform well. It's like, well, if you're taking away my ability to perform well, saying I can't do this and that and the other thing, you know, the only way to go about it is to decentralize my work and so that it's private and do what I need to do to get the job done. So it's like, oftentimes this decentralization of documentation is like a self-preservation thing or it's like a way to like actually circumvent like policies that make no sense so like this i think you'll see a lot and then uh documentation rarely referenced by network operators due to above complications that's a big one too uh, people have their own way of doing it you know like i talked about a, a john henry it's like you know how can you say to someone do it my way when their way's better so yep uh these this, this is therapeutic again uh the next one is scale um networks are not getting smaller internet of things iot wireless access points ip phones rapid wan expansion expansion Cloud adoption and larger data centers are leading to massive enterprise networks. Interesting. I, I want to talk to, I'm going to have a conversation with the AI about this because this is, this is interesting to me. So, um, we're, we're going to say, um, in the above statement, Explain why the things stated are relevant to enterprise networks. How are enterprise networks involved in uh when wireless cloud and data center 
networks, style networks. Are these not separate and unrelated entities? That's the question I have. And the answer is no, they are uh, not uh, separate and unrelated. But uh, let's hear more. Certainly. The statement you provided highlights the complexity and interconnectedness of modern enterprise networks. Let's break down the relevance of each component to enterprise networks and explain how they are not separate and unrelated entities. Internet of Things, IoT. IoT devices are becoming increasingly common in enterprise environments. These devices can include anything from smart thermostats to industrial machinery that's connected to the network. They allow for automation, real-time monitoring, and data collection, but they also add complexity to the network and require proper security and management. Wireless access points. With the rise of mobile devices and the need for flexibility in the workplace, wireless networks are essential. They enable employees to connect to the network from anywhere within the premises, enhancing collaboration and productivity. Managing these access points is a critical part of network administration. IP phones. Voice over IP, VoIP technology has replaced traditional phone lines in many enterprises. These phones use the same network infrastructure as computers and other devices, allowing for easier management and integration with other business tools. Rapid WAN expansion. One wide area network connects different local area networks, lands, often across cities or even countries. As businesses grow and open new locations, the WAN must expand to keep everything connected. This is essential for sharing resources and maintaining communication between different parts of the business. Cloud adoption. Many enterprises are moving services and data to the cloud. This can reduce costs and increase flexibility, but requires a robust network to ensure that access to cloud resources is fast and reliable. The enterprise network must be designed to handle this traffic efficiently. Larger data centers. As data needs grow, so do data centers. These are the hubs where an organization's data and applications reside. Managing these data centers and ensuring that they are accessible to users across the enterprise is a complex task that's central to modern network management. In summary, these components are not separate and unrelated entities, but integral parts of modern enterprise network. They are interconnected and must be managed as a cohesive whole. The growth in these areas reflects the increasing complexity and importance of network management in today's business environments. All right, I just want to see how these are related. Oh, it can't it can't sketch out a text diagram. Okay, so so enterprise network diagram. So we'd have a central hub, would which, which would be the data center. Um, you know what? Let's let's do this. Let's let's pull up paint and let's let's uh, draw the diagram that they're talking about here. So the first thing in the diagram is going to be a large box. So we'll place a uh, large box in the center of the diagram. And the diagram center is like about here. All right, and then we're gonna label that box data center. Uh, maybe tools is where we get text. Yeah, there we go. Data center. Perfect. All right, so this represents the core of the enterprise network where servers, storage, and essential applications reside. All right, so the next thing uh, we have are WAN connections. So draw lines extending from the data center box to smaller boxes labeled with different branch locations or other uh, data centers. Uh, labeled these uh, as WAN to represent wide area network connections between different parts of the business. All right, so let's do that. We're going to have um, the box again, um, and we're going to do uh, two, two smaller boxes. Uh, so like that, and then we'll do uh, one up here, and then we'll do another one. Um, you know what? Let's just have those two. Um, so then, then we'll have a, uh, a line. There we go. And now we'll label them. So the, the line's going to be labeled when, uh, like that. And then when, uh, I got to shrink this down. There we go, like that, and then um, we're gonna say um, uh, East Coast DC uh, OK, 
okay. And then we'll say West Coast DC. Okay, so there we go. Um, so these are wide area network connections between different parts of the business. All right, so now local area network connections, LAN connections, including wireless access points and IP phones. So inside each uh, branch location box, um, draw smaller uh, boxes representing individual devices like, um, is this right? I guess, I guess it's not it's not mentioned there. But see, the thing is, like, typically the data center is not, uh, like, even if it's not a cloud data center, you know, it's typically not, like, like, the cloud is just, the cloud just means, like, who it's owned by. So, like, the data center, if it's on-prem, you know, it's still not going to be on-prem. Like, it's going to be in an actual data center like the cloud just means like who owns the actual gear so like to put the ip phones iot devices and uh computers in the data center like that's not how it usually is as far as i know it's like you'll have the data center like connected via a wan to the branch office like the ac actual office buildings and that's something I kind of want to get away from, to be honest. Like, I want to work for, like, on-site work. Like, I want to kind of disconnect myself from anything, like, related to that. So, like, you know, IP phones, IoT, computers. Like, okay, great. If it's for, like, something like a hotel, if it's for, like, a resort, if it's for, like residential homes if it's for something like great but like i mean honestly like you know there's always going to be the need for remote work so it's like i guess i guess it's not that big of a deal but i don't know but anyways uh you would connect these devices with lines to a symbol representing a switch or router from the switch or router draw a line to a symbol representing a wireless access point Label these connections as LAN to represent the local area network within each location. IoT, cloud. See, here's where it gets really, like, you know, these are notorious for giving wrong answers. So, like, draw a cloud symbol outside the data center box and connect it with a line. You know, you wouldn't have it th like that. Like, like, you have your own on-prem data center, which usually isn't on-prem premises, like the premises of your business. Like it's it's in the footprint of the, your business is a better way to think of like the premises of your business. And the footprint of your business's business can reside in a data center that is owned and operated by another business. It's just like you're the one managing the devices in that. Like, or you can pay pay for a cloud provider and have them manage the devices. Um, so, you know, you're not going to have both a data center and a cloud connection, I guess. I don't know. But I don't think this, this is accurate. I'm going to move on from it because it's just not, uh, it's not answering my question um, in an accurate way. So I'm, I'm going to ask you one more question. What about office buildings? Are these a part of an enterprise network? See, like, this is just confusing me because, like, I don't think this is right at all. They house the physical infrastructure that makes up a local area network, LAN, and often connect with wide area network, WAN, that links yeah. various locations of the enterprise. Here's how office buildings fit into the enterprise network. Local area network, LAN. Within an office building, you'll find a LAN, which connects all the devices within that location. This includes computers, printers, IP phones, IoT devices, and wireless access points. The LAN enables communication and resource sharing within the building. Network infrastructure. Office buildings house essential network equipment such as switches, routers, firewalls, and servers. 
This equipment is often located in a dedicated server room or data closet within the building. Wireless access points. Many office buildings provide wireless connectivity throughout the premises, allowing employees and guests to connect mobile devices to the network. Connection to WAN. Office buildings are often connected to the enterprise's WAN, enabling communication with other locations, data centers, and cloud services. This connection may be facilitated through dedicated lines, VPNs, or other technologies. Security measures. Security within an office building's network is crucial. This includes both physical security, E. G. Restricted access to server rooms and network security, E. G. Alright, so one final question, I'm going to move on. Terms LAN, local area network, and WAN, wide area network, refer to two different types of networks that serve distinct purposes. Here's a breakdown of their differences and why WANs aren't considered LANs. LAN, local area network, geographical scope. LANs are typically confined to a small geographical area, such as a single building, office, or campus. They connect devices within this limited area. Data transfer speed. LANs usually offer high data transfer rates since the devices are close to each other. Ownership. LANs are often owned, set up, and maintained by a single organization or individual. Connection media. LANs typically use Ethernet cables or Wi-Fi to connect devices. Cost. Generally, LANs are less expensive to set up and maintain compared to WANs. Maximum size. The size of a LAN can vary, but it's usually limited to a few kilometers at most. Yeah, so like like the difference between fiber and copper is like a big difference between LAN and WAN. Because like fiber has a larger range than than copper. Understanding these concepts is essential for network design. And like even with fiber, like the difference between single mode and multi mode is like the difference between LAN. Like you'd use a, you'd use a multi mode like within a data center or like an on premise uh enterprise on premise uh network. Um, like a LAN, the <laughs> but you'd use single mode for WANs. Okay. Okay, so here's a LAN configuration. The other thing with LANs is is you have like VLANs more. So in a LAN, you, you know, it stands for a virtual local area network. It's not a VWAN, it's a VLAN. So uh, so like here's a switch setting, VLANs go on switches. Um, so uh, yeah, so you assign IP addresses, manage other local settings. You also use like these private class A, B, or C uh, addresses for a, for a LAN. Uh, for a WAN, uh, that's, that's like a public network, so you've got to use public addressing for that. Um, so like here's a WAN configuration example. So you'd use like PPP, uh, different encapsulation, because you're using a, a serial link. Serial links are, um, you know, have a, a longer range um, as far as I understand. So like, you know, it's, it's about the range, the distances. It's about the kind of gear you're using um so um yeah so interface types uh you use ethernet for for wans ethernet uses like cat uh 5e cables cat 6 cables which have a, a hard limit at like 100 meters so if you want to go from state to state or coast to coast you've got to use wan uh interface types which are serial or fiber or single mode because um, those go uh, way, way longer than 100 meters. Um, the other thing is uh, encapsulation. Um, since it's uh, WAN are, are often not, um, you know, Ethernet, um, it, it uses a different uh, encapsulation. PPP, HDLC, um, IP addressing is different, uh, private for LANs, because those are local to your area, you don't have to put them out in public, and then WANs are, are long distance, uh, you know, connections out, out there in public, so use um, uh, public, uh, and, and the other thing is, uh, when it comes to uh, NAT, uh, LANs are inside local, and uh, WANs are outside global, from what I understand, if I remember correctly. And then uh, WANs, um, VPNs, MPLS, lease lines. Um, sometimes you have to do advanced things, additional things. Like like all these kinds of technologies, MPLS, uh, exist uh, for WANs. So like the difference between WAN and LAN 
is is quite a difference um isps are are you're dealing with wans and then like a um you know a network administrator um you're dealing with uh wans so like the difference between wan and lan is a lot of times the difference between this certification track if you're going down the service provider certification track you're really focusing in on wans if you're going down like the enterprise you're probably focusing a bit more on lands so there's quite a there's quite a difference between the two and there's also mans metro area networks routers and land environment are used to connect different vlans or to provide a gateway to the internet or wan they operate at layer 3 network layer and use ip addresses access points Wireless access points provide Wi-Fi connectivity within LAN, allowing wireless devices to connect to the wired network. Ethernet cables. LANs typically use Ethernet cables, E, G, Cat5e, Cat6, to connect devices. These cables have distance limitations, usually around 100 meters for a single segment. NIC, network interface cards. These are used in computers and other devices to connect to the LAN, either through Ethernet or Wi-Fi. WAN hardware WAN routers. WAN routers are specialized devices that connect different LANs over a wide area. They handle more complex routing protocols and often include features for security, quality of service, codes, and more. Serial and other specialized interfaces. WAN connections often use serial interfaces or other specialized connections like T1, E1 lines. These interfaces require specific modules or cards and router. Modems and CSU, DSUs, channel service unit, data service unit. These devices are used to connect to different types of WAN services, such as DSL or lease lines. Multiplexers. In some WAN environments, multiplexers are used to combine multiple signals over a single physical connection, optimizing bandwidth usage. Firewalls and VPN concentrators. Security is often more complex in a WAN, and specialized hardware like firewalls and VPN concentrators might be used to protect and encrypt data. Key differences scale and complexity. WAN hardware is generally more complex and designed to handle broader geographical distances and more diverse connection types. Cost. WAN hardware tends to be more expensive, reflecting its increased complexity and capabilities. Functionality. LAN hardware focuses on connecting devices within a localized area, while WAN hardware is designed to connect multiple LANs across cities, countries, or even continents. Understanding these hardware differences is essential for network design, implementation, and troubleshooting. Since you're preparing for the Encore Cisco exam, make sure to include... Alright, so one final question. What is a MAN? <laughs> because, uh, yeah, metropolitan area network, so... Yep. It's larger than local area network land, but smaller than a wide area network. Yeah, WAN. exactly. So it's, it's like a medium sized. So like you're still going to have. Um, yeah. So like this is where like you need like something a little bit more. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this is like where frame relay and, and ATM are. Um, so, yeah. So these are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like it's like you need something more than you need for. A LAN, but you don't want to spend as much for a WAN because you don't need it that far. So that it's like an in between. So like, yeah, this is really good. This is like really solid, and this is all accurate too, as far as I know. Like this is information like I already know. I just need like a reminder of, and like it, it's really solid. All right, so networks are not getting smaller. IoT, wireless access points, IP phones, rapid WAN expansion, cloud adoption, and larger data centers are leading to massive enterprise networks. CLI simply does not scale unless more people are added to manage the network. All right, so the other um, key problem inherent to the legacy approach is uh, that the legacy approach is error prone. Mistakes happen with manual changes. Um, it requires the legacy approach requires orchestration of complex changes, ensuring the correct order of device and command entry. Legacy approach requires work to be done several times per change, plan, document, submit, and implement into production. The legacy approach sometimes. Uh, so sometimes approval processes or operational mistakes occur where changes are completed out of order from when they were submitted, causing overwrites or outages. All right, so another um, problem, another key problem inherent to the legacy approach is uh, large scale changes. New to, to deployment of new features often takes a very long time because of scale or complexity. New business requirements and device types connecting to the network may require QoS policy changes, leading to rewrite the QoS policy for every device. Some changes are avoided because the 
effort required to make a correction or deploy a feature is too great. So this, this is a big one too. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, there's these nice to have features like a, a banner that's like nice and crisp and, and um, consistent from device to device. Um, even even things like uh, like SLA, you know, if it's if it's not super critical, but it's like a nice to have, you know, it's just, it's just the other the other big thing is like some of the little like like firewall changes. It, it just gets to a point where it's like sure it'd be great to have a really well secure um, network, but like if you have to change tens of thousands of firewalls. Um, you know, just having a more insecure network is, is the convenience trade-off is, is worth it. But with uh, automation, you, you don't have to worry about that because you can implement large scale changes um, uh, in a timely and accurate way. All right, so uh, the other key problem with uh, the legacy method of working on networks is the limitations of available alternatives. Aside from CLI or an NMS, there are very few alternatives to managing a network. Newer intent-based solutions have only recently emerged with little proven capability. And the other problem is talent. The complexity of networks has grown along with their size and scale. Virtualization, multicast, QoS, STP, routing, routing protocols, cloud security, firewalls, wireless, voice, video, HSS, HSRP, VPN, 802.1x, along with increasingly complicated commands to gather information. Staffing challenges such as finding certified IT staff or expanding network operations headcount. Um, every change to the network becomes a challenge as the complexity increases. So that that's a problem with the legacy way of doing it. Um, you know, look at all the look at all these things. So you gotta you gotta find someone that, you know, knows everything. And it's it's just like you know, there's so much. Like these are all divided into different tracks: enterprise, service provider, cloud. Those are different certification tracks. So unless you find someone with, you know, all the certifications that that cover everything here you're really going to have to hire someone that, you know, th they know STP, they know routing, routing protocols. Um, they know uh, things like uh, uh, VSS, HSRP, but they don't know much about cloud. They don't know much about um, security. They don't know much about uh, f firewalls outside of uh, like ACL statements. So like they, they've never been an administrator of a Palo Alto firewall. They don't, they don't know much about load balancing, like F, F5 load balancers. So it's like, um, you know, it's hard to find, uh, people to, to, you know, fill in all these niches. So like if you have automation, um, I'm not sure how automation would solve that actually, because it seems like you're just centralizing all of that information down to the person designing the automation. That seems bad. So kind of a, hopefully he will address that uh, later. All right. So the next one is cost, uh, downtime and change, uh, window requirements with automation. You can schedule those changes out for later or just changes are not as impactful because, um, there's less of a ability to make errors as they mentioned before and then uh overtime requirements um yeah for all these change management windows and and, and anything goes wrong troubleshooting outages um a person has to be there and take care of that so if you can prevent all that um you lower the uh, extra labor costs and uh you free up your employees to uh have a, a better time all right, and then large network operations staffing requirements. So you can, that might not be a <laughs> perk to some people, um, th but that's why I think it's really important to jump on this bandwagon. So I'm, I'm doing my best um, 
to do that and i'm loving this book oh my god this book is amazing so uh yep that's going to be it uh for this video um i'm gonna say you are here and uh i'm gonna post that and then um uh, I'm going to say, uh, chapter one, part one, that's, that's how I'll, that's how I'll label this. And, uh, when I come back, we'll be, uh, starting here. So, um, uh, let's see how long, how long, oh, oh, an hour's about a good mark for each one of these. So, um, that's the end of this video. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.